Hi there, I'm Stephanie Smith, Hello. and I'd like to welcome you to Book Tribe's live chat. Today's guest is Jack McLean, author of the political thriller Global Predator. For those who are just learning about the book, Global Predator is a political thriller following a corrupt banker on the run for embezzling money. He escapes to Pakistan, where he reunites with his old flame and is exposed to the harsh treatment Pakistani women face from the local Taliban. Jack is an award-winning foreign news correspondent in Britain with an expertise on foreign affairs in Asia. Before we begin, I want to mention that we'll be giving away copies of Global Predator, so be sure to sign up at Booktrib and enter to win at the end of the chat. Now, I would like to welcome Jack McLean to our live chat. Thank you, Jack, for joining us today. Let's start off by me. letting <laughs> let's start off by letting your fans know more about the book. So, how would you describe Global Predator? Uh, well, it's a thriller which is about uh, the drone wars in Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan, and it's set in largely in the Swat Valley, which is a kind of uh, skiing paradise. Uh, in, in northern Pakistan, which used to be on the sort of hippie trail. And um, it was uh, taken over by uh, a, a Taliban, local Taliban movement there. And uh, after I finished the book, um, there was a schoolgirl there, uh, Malala Yousafzai, who um, was shot in the head. And she uh, this year won the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. And um, so, so the areas had a fair amount of publicity. Um, but when I was writing about it, uh, not many people had heard of the war going on there. And the efforts of aid workers in uh, Pakistan and of uh, Pakistani women themselves to encourage um, uh, girls to go to school, um, because this is one of the uh, key uh, battlegrounds between um, the Taliban and the rest of the population because they've been uh, waging a campaign to bomb uh, all the um, uh, schools which were hosting girls uh, all over the valley and this became the, the focus of, of the kind of uh, civil war which was going on there <clears throat> and occasionally the Pakistan government would intervene. Um, at the same time, um, the uh, United States was uh, organizing a campaign to target the Al-Qaeda leaders uh, who were hiding out in Pakistan who had come over the border from Afghanistan and um, and so, uh, as everyone knows, they, they, they eventually um, found Osama bin Laden, uh, but they're still looking for his number two deputy, Ayman al-Zawahiri. So the subplot of this is, is the attempt by the CIA and uh, the National Security Agency, the NSA, to track down and to assassinate uh, Ayman al-Zawahiri. And so they've made uh, quite a number of attempts to to get him, and they haven't managed to uh, eliminate him yet, but they've come very close. So uh, uh, quite a lot of the book actually uh, follows uh, real-life events. So uh, these attempts against al Zawahiri and the civil war in the Swat Valley um, pretty much follow uh, what's actually been going on. Yeah, definitely. Um, that was actually something I really liked when I was reading your book about how you have, you're able to look at both a microcosm and a macrocosm, that you have this issue with Wilkins and Sally, and they're dealing with the immediate issue in front of them with building these schools for these young women. But then you also have the issue with the NSA trying to track down uh, al Zawahiri throughout the novel as well. And I was wondering, you know, if you could talk a little bit more about what made you decide to be able to pair these two stories together, because they're almost, they're, they're such great ideas that they could almost be standalone novels themselves. Uh, what really influenced you to really pair the two together? 
Uh, well, I, w- I really like the plot device of having uh, two manhunts going on simultaneously. So in the novel, we have uh, the manhunt for um, the, 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 the famous al-Qaeda leader, Ayman al-Zawahiri, um, and that mirrors, mirrors uh, real life. And so uh, one of the objects of the book was actually to kind of explain uh, how these drone wars are waged and the importance that the NSA and, and the new technology uh, plays uh, in, in this uh, sort of almost sort of secret war that's, that's going on. And, uh, and also to explain the limitations of this technology and how the um, terrorists are able to try and turn uh, this technology uh, against the Americans. So you have this um, a very uh, seventh century kind of, of social uh, religious uh, movement which is being um, countered by this very sophisticated, very technologically advanced um, uh, machine, the uh, global predator, and, uh, and the satellites and all this eavesdropping uh, technology. And so, you know, there's kind of a chess game going on between these two forces. And then the other uh, plot in um, the story is, is about these rogue traders and Global Predator also refers to the uh, international uh, banking problem in, in which uh, bankers are able to manipulate data and uh, communication systems to speculate on the world markets and to create these um, uh, global financial crises. So um, the subplot is that one of these world traders is uh, uh, a quant um, uh, programmer, and uh, he devises this program to uh, make money by secretly trading on the world foreign currency markets, and he gets uh, caught out, he's under suspicion, and he decides to flee, and he thinks, well, where is the safest place to, to hide out? And it's got to be somewhere where, you know, the British police can't reach him and the bank can't reach him, which would be in these bad lands, the hinterlands of northwest uh, Pakistan. Definitely. Um, I know that our one of our live chat members named Ken uh, has a question for you. He said, Wilkins okay. pretty much uses his friendship with Sally to get what he wants. He says, Did you envision him getting into trouble when he was in Pakistan as some sort of payback? Uh, yeah, I think to uh, contemplate that, and uh, I, I think the idea, you know, what I quite like as a plot device as well, uh, apart from having two sort of manhunts concurrently, was to have a character who's initially very unsympathetic, and um, and you sort of are more concerned with uh, his ex-girlfriend Sally than with him, and uh, gradually as he becomes exposed to her world, and these, uh, you know, great social and moral uh, battles which are being waged in, in Pakistan, that he gradually, through his contact with her and through his involuntary involvement um, in, in the defense of the uh, people running these girls' schools, and the people who were taken hostage and being killed, that he gradually transforms and becomes a better person at the end. So, so that was the inspiration. And so, um, the the kind of interest for the reader is to see whether he will actually um, uh, make this uh, moral transformation, or he will get his just deserts, and he will in fact be, be killed by the Taliban. So, so that was sort of part of the suspense of of, of the novel as well. And Alex has a question. Uh, this person asking, do you think your book might shed some light on the American drone program and its possible dangers? Yes, I, I think that that was uh, when I when I started writing this book. Um, uh, five years ago, 
Um, the, the idea was to try and uh, un understand uh, the drone program and how it works and, and its shortcomings. And um, um, you know, these drones started being used in uh, in, in, in Iraq, and then uh, they used spread to uh, Afghanistan and now in Pakistan. And uh, the Pakistanis are extremely uh, angry about these uh, kind of assassination programs, effectively, which are being run in their territory. And so there's a huge conflict uh, uh, among the Pakistanis and between um, uh, Pakistan and America about the legitimacy of these programs. And uh, one of the chief criticisms of the program is that it um, is not very good at actually finding um, the targets. Um, and so one of the ways that the Taliban and Al-Qaeda is able to turn this technology against the Americans is by constantly harping on the fact that uh, civilians are being killed um, by these missiles fired by the, by the drones. Um, and, and so that's also, you know, is to explain the propaganda war and to explain how gradually the global predator campaign is, is actually also evolving. And so they're becoming better and better at actually uh, identifying and targeting um, um, this, the, the, the enemies of America. Um, and minimizing civilian casualties. And so, but the, the, the plot of the book is actually that the uh, Taliban attempt to uh, create an incident where the CIA um, inadvertently uh, targets a school where all these um, um, girls uh, are studying and causes an atrocity, which puts pressure on the Pakistan government to force the American government to halt um, these drone attacks. Um, and so, you know, that's very much what, what's been going on in the last um, uh, six or seven years. And I, I, I believe uh, that uh, the, the drone technology is going to become more and more common uh, throughout the world and it's going to be used not only by, by Americans but by uh, many other countries as well, um, as this technology becomes uh, cheaper and cheaper to to mass produce and to replicate. So I think these drones um, are are here to stay, and of course they're now being used again in Iraq and Syria. Um, and um, and and it's kind of fascinating how you know just the very idea that somebody could be uh, sitting uh, outside Las Vegas in, you know, basically in a big container and uh, operating a plane and a weapon which is uh, thousands and thousands of miles away. Um, I think the second thing which was sort of interesting about this drone technology is that it um, is actually not really used as a weapon because it cannot actually be used against a conventional military force because it's quite easy to shoot these drones down with a rocket. Um, they're mainly being used against guerrillas uh, who don't have this kind of armory at, at their disposal. And um, actually what they're really e useful for is a kind of uh, poor man substitute for having a satellite because of course the satellite costs uh, tons of money to send up in space and to operate, but uh, a drone costs a few million dollars and it can fly over an area, take photographs, survey people and follow people. Um, but its um, other liability is that um, it's not very useful at tracking people in urban environments. It's quite good in places like the Northwest Frontier or Afghanistan where you've got you know, people driving jeeps across huge open spaces or through mountains. But as soon as somebody disappears in an urban environment, it's very hard to keep track of them. And it's certainly very hard to um, um, to fire a missile at them and kill them. Oh, wow. That, that was 
you know, there's a lot, definitely a lot involved with the technology there and whatnot. I'm going to swing the conversation a little bit more back to Paxton and looking at mm -hmm. the history there. Uh, Key, mm -hmm. one of our, another live chat audience member, is interested in Aziza Yusufzai and mentions that she has an in-depth family history with Pakistan. Could you talk further about your research on Pakistan and the local traditions there? Yeah, I think um, um, I, I wanted to also sort of explain how the Pakistanis see this and uh, what are the conflicts in, in Pakistan. I mean, Pakistan has been an extremely uh, difficult ally for the United States um, ever since the, um, um, the uh, Soviet invasion of Pakistan, where Pakistan was the base for um, the uh, insurgents to, to fight the Russians. Um, and then uh, the Taliban and its allies took over um, Afghanistan and there was an invasion. And, and Pakistan and uh, the Pakistan Secret Service, the ISI, has been sort of uh, playing both ends of the candle against each other because they've been trying to reassert their control over Afghanistan and to use these Taliban forces against India, against America, um, and against Iran. And so there's a very complicated um, war going on there. And there are also all kinds of local uh, insurgencies as well, which threaten to tear Pakistan uh, apart. And so one of the stories is that one of the characters gets involved and becomes victim to the Baluchistan uh, independence movement, um, the Baluchistan Liberation Front. Um, so I, I tried in the book to explain the complexities of that. And um, the most important ethnic group are the uh, Pashtuns, because they form most of the members of the Afghan and Pakistan um, Taliban. And these are uh, an ethnic group, a kind of warrior group, who uh, population uh, bestrides both sides of the Pakistan-Afghan border, and there should really be um, one independent state, um, because they don't regard this border as, as a legitimate border, and so they're constantly crossing backwards and forwards. And this uh, Pashtun nationalism is being exploited by religious groups um, for, for their own aims. And the uh, uh, Pashtuns have their own code of, uh, of honor, and uh, particularly their own code of uh, revenge. So they're constantly in these uh, inter-family, inter-tribal feuds. And uh, so, so making war and, you know, families fighting each other and killing each other, um, that's very much part of their makeup. And, and sometimes that uh, Pashtun code and, and the uh, revenge uh, honor code, the Badal, uh, conflicts actually with Sharia law. So you've got um, sort of two things going on, the sort of ethnic Pashtun thing and the ultra-religious Sharia law uh, campaigners and militants. Um, so, so uh, you know, although I'm making this sound all very complicated, um, I think, you know, one of the things I wanted to do in the book was to kind of use fiction as a way of explaining um, in an easy to absorb way some of the uh, complexities of these wars being fought in these faraway countries. Definitely. No, I could definitely see that throughout the book, and that was, I definitely appreciate it. That was interesting. Uh, another one of our, uh, another guest mentioned from Quinn. Uh, who are you more sympathetic towards, either Stoner or Faiza? And could you talk about them a little bit further? Uh, yeah, Stoner is um, the uh, accountant who um, um, was uh, in, in, in involved uh, the main character in this um, the, the quant uh, workings in in this. Um, um, money making, fraudulent money making venture at the bank in London. And, uh, um, and when suspicion falls on him, uh, and he kind of blackmails, um, Wilkins into taking the job at the bank, 
um, and defrauding the bank, and uh, then he sent by the head of the bank to trace uh, Wilkins. And so um, Stoner is uh, is a kind of villain, and he's also you know the uh, the, the the enemy of Wilkins, and he's. Uh, you know, sometimes you feel quite sympathetic to him because he suddenly plunged into this uh, very difficult situation where he himself gets entangled in, in the machinations of the different uh, groups operating in, in Pakistan and eventually comes to a, a grisly end. And uh, one of the things I talk quite a lot about um, is this uh, game, gaming strategy and, and gaming science um, which are used in, in uh, 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 quant science and uh, there's a particular game um, which is called Prisoner's Dilemma. So, so in the book there's a real life uh, Prisoner's Dilemma um, where two prisoners are, are caught and uh, they're held in prison and one is invited to betray the other um, in order to obtain a reduced sentence. And so the two prisoners who are held separately have to work out whether the other prisoner is likely to betray him, or if they both keep quiet, they will both uh, uh, escape lightly because they don't confess. So, so that's a kind of uh, prisoner's develop, uh, dilemma. Um, and um, um, what, one of the uh, other characters is Pfizer, and she is an ethnic Afghan who originally works at the uh, NSA. She's eavesdropping on conversations picked up by, by predators, uh, fun conversations. And uh, she has a burning desire to get al-Zawahiri because he killed her father in Herat in, in Afghanistan when um, Al-Qaeda took over part of uh, Afghanistan. And, uh, and she manages to get herself on the counterintelligence team at the CIA, which is tracking um, uh, al-Zawahiri. It's a kind of subgroup of the group which was after Osama bin Laden. And she um, is kind of a heroine in the book because she plays a leading role um, in helping uh, the global predator team and the CIA uh, find out with Sawahiri and to see through uh, the plot which has been set up by uh, Al Zawahiri and uh, and the Taliban. So she's um, a kind of very bright spark, and so. As you can gather in the book, the, the um, female characters are generally more sympathetic and um, more moral and more honest, um, but also very driven. Um, but they're certainly the sort of better half of, uh, of the characters in the book. Um, so the men are usually the bad guys uh, in this story. Thank you. Uh, and Sunny May would like to ask you, do you know the ending before you began writing, or does the story unfold along the way as you discover other sides of the characters? Uh, well, I, I started off with the idea of I like, just called Global Predator was just uh, a, a great name for a book, and, um, and that was the original idea that I wanted to write about the drones, and I wanted to write about um, these uh, wicked bankers. And so sort of mix the two stories, and um, um, I, I pretty much um, had the ending worked out. And uh, I had more difficulty with the beginning because the beginning is a bit complicated because um, you're introducing, uh, you know, a, a quite a large cast of characters, and you gradually bring their different stories and weave them together to reach a climax. And in all thrillers. You know, there's got to be a lot of suspense. There's got to, it's got to end in some kind of fighting and denouement, and um, you know, with, with big explosions. And when finally uh, the global predator and its deadly uh, hellfire missiles are actually put to use, so it moves from people thinking uh, 
he's thinking this and I'm thinking that and he knows I'm thinking this and so on. You know, you, you move from that idea where people are trying to work out what their enemies are doing to actually a conflict when all the the main issues and, and the divided loyalties of the characters are resolved. And so, so actually I think with the first thriller, you have to start with the ending and, um, uh, and kind of work backwards from that. So that's what I tried to do. Uh, well, uh, Jennifer also has a question. She was wondering, why did you make Sally a social worker? Did you have any other professions in mind for her while you were writing the book? Uh, no, I, I definitely wanted um, to, to have, um, well, first of all, a, a Westerner that um, Western readers can identify. I wanted to have somebody who was um, um, altruistic, and um, so you would sympathize with her. And I wanted to have somebody who would get into trouble and then get into deeper and deeper trouble as the plot develops so that you're kind of rooting for her and you're hoping that she finds a way out of the problems, but actually her difficulties and the threats against her man up. So, so that's sort of part of the technique of, of building up suspense. And Katie's wondering, uh, are you working on any new projects that we can keep an eye out for? Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm doing a couple of projects. Um, I, I'm doing a, a, a follow-up um, uh, novel, which is set in Hong Kong in um, uh, 1948, just before the fall of Shanghai. And uh, it's about um, a, a naval officer who decides to stay on in Hong Kong, and he gets involved with um, a number of uh, real-life gangsters who are fleeing uh, from Shanghai and are setting up in Hong Kong and planning to use Hong Kong as a base for exporting uh, a new drug, heroin, to the United States and to create a new market there. So this is about the Green Gang, um, who, who were once very famous and powerful, and a real-life character called Duya Shang. And um, and so it's sort of set in this uh, transition period in Hong Kong where there were lots of gangsters there, there were communists there, there were nationalists, there were kind of Japanese fleeing from, uh, who, who had committed all kinds of atrocities. And um, so, so I wanted to write uh, a bit more about um, uh, Chinese culture and about Hong Kong, which I'm very familiar with. And, um, and to create a series about um, uh, a sort of uh, art dealer in Hong Kong who gets involved in all these uh, intrigues. And um, so that's one project I'm doing. Uh, I've also finished a book about, which is <coughs> a um, non-fiction book, which is about uh, why communism failed and it's about um, the history of a number of economists um, who predicted that right from the start that you couldn't run a, a socialist economy uh, because of something called the socialist calculation problem, which is when you have a society without money, uh, without markets, and without prices, it's very difficult to calculate um, and to therefore to plan an economy because you can't measure anything except in quantities. And, um, and from the 1930s onwards, lots and lots of people uh, believed, however, the Soviet Union and its economy was a great success. And during the Cold War, the CIA continually produced reports which were endorsed by the top economists at Harvard and other places, saying that the Soviet economy was uh, growing much faster than the US economy, and East Germany was doing much better than West Germany and so on, and the Chinese economy was uh, going gangbusters. And, um, and all these people would pop up um, 
some of them from the Soviet Union, and would say this is all rubbish, all these statistics are just uh, garbage, and they would be shouted down, they wouldn't be allowed to publish their books, um, but these people actually correctly predicted the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, and were later acknowledged as having been correct, and the CIA for 30 years and spent or 40 years and spending you know, tens of billions of dollars following the Soviet Union got everything wrong. So, so I've kind of pulled together this story, um, which uh, is another thing I've been working on for, for many years. So, so some very different projects. Wow, yeah, we can definitely expect a lot from you. So it sounds like there's a lot going on. Um, we have time for one more question, and I think I'd like to ask the last question. I'm looking at, okay. you know, do you like being a journalist more or an author more? Um, well, I think it's uh, much more enjoyable being a journalist um, because um, you're kind of hunting in the pack with lots of colleagues. You know, you write a story and then it appears in the paper the next day. Um, people interview you. People say, oh, that was a great story. I read that. And so you constantly have this uh, feedback and sort of approbation, and, um, and and you're sort of part of a team as well, and you have quite a large uh, readership. Um, so that's sort of more enjoyable in, in, in many ways. Um, when you're a writer, you're pretty much on your own, and you um, uh, need, you know, a year, several years, in my case, many years, to produce a, a, a novel, a thriller, and you pretty much have to do it on your own because people don't really want to read something that is half finished or a draft, so you don't get much feedback. Um, but the big plus side is that um, um, you know your book is going to be out there uh, potentially for you know a very long time, whereas a newspaper, as we say in England, just gets used to wrap up fish and chips the next day and your story is usually forgotten. Um, so, um, um, so so if, if you write a good book and you, you attract a lot of readers and you know people maybe um, make a film about it or a TV series, you know, the potential is that your book will have a much longer life um, and reach a much bigger audience because you're doing something much more approachable. Um, but um, if your book uh, doesn't make it, of course, you can end up with very few readers. And um, um, so, so that, you know, the, the pluses and minuses. Um, I, I, I have to say, you know, my second book that I'm now writing, the second novel, is much easier to write uh, because I've already sort of gone through the agony of sort of uh, learning a new skill, writing a, a thriller, creating believable characters, um, you know, using dialogue. Um, so, so it becomes easier, and because it's easier, you can sort of concentrate more on the important aspects of um, creating living characters. Uh, because one of the great things about writing non-fiction is that you can simply make things up. You know, with a journalist, you have to say what somebody said. It's, you know, he said that, he said this, you know, uh, this expert uh, wrote this paper, this politician said that. You know, you're, um, you're not really using your imagination the way you are uh, with a novel, and ultimately using your own imagination and creating your own world and style is, um, I, I think, is uh, extremely satisfying and enjoyable. Well, Jack, I think that's all that we have time for today. But thank you so much for visiting with us on uh, Book Trib and looking, joining us for this live chat. I'd like to remind all of our uh, audience members to sign up at Book Trib to win a copy of Jack McLean's new book, The Global Predator. Um, so once again, Jack, thanks again for coming in. It was an absolute pleasure talking with you. Thanks very much, Stephanie. And thank you for everyone who's been listening into this. Bye-bye. All right, have a great day, everyone. See you later, Jack. <laughs> Bye. Bye.